Hello, everyone. This is JSA TV and JSA Podcasts, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. My name is Laurel Burton. I am an executive vice president of strategy here at JSA TV. Uh, and more importantly, I'm your moderator for today. On behalf of everyone here at JSA, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm excited to say that we've had well over 250 registrants already, and I'm sure on demand we're going to have even more. And I think it just goes to prove the importance of today's topic as we delve deeper into the industry's continued efforts around greener solutions and greener data outcomes for all. Before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping for everyone. First and foremost, I want to let you know that this is a platform that uh, allows for networking after the panel discussion. So I would ask all of you to please remain on the bridge and you're going to automatically be transferred into a live networking session as soon as this panel discussion concludes. And you'll be able to take your seat at a virtual table to meet and network with your, your speakers and fellow attendees immediately following our conversation. Second, this is an interactive session, so if you have any questions, feel free to share, share those uh, by typing them in. I think there's even emojis you can use if you'd like. And last but not least, uh, for the first 100 of you that registered ahead of the event, we've provided lunch for those of you um, that have registered. So please enjoy lunch on behalf of JSA while we get started. So let's start. Um, I would like to start by uh, introducing all of our speakers. So um, if all of you could please introduce yourself, the company you're with, and tell us a little bit about why you're passionate about today's topic. Wes, can we start with you? And then I'm going to have Kim, Avery, and Patrick also do the same. Wes, let's begin with you. Yeah, good morning uh, or afternoon, depending on where you're at. I'm Wes Swenson. I'm the CEO of Nova Data Centers. We're headquartered in Salt Lake City, Utah, expanding uh, mainly in the West right now, but eventually across the United States. Uh, we do mostly new design greenfield green builds. Um, that's what we focus on. And I'm passionate about this because, uh, you know, being in a leadership position, it would be a waste otherwise to not try to do something better to improve on our carbon footprint and the materials we consume, especially concrete when we build these facilities, things like that. So it's it's a it's just part of our ethos. So we're very passionate about it. Thank you, Kim. Hello, um, I'm Kim Gunelius, Chief Commercial Officer and uh, co-founder of uh, Vern Global Finland. Um, and I'm still uh, practicing to say that because we just recently rebranded. So uh, Ficolo uh, was the name that we were using until recently, since about 10 years ago. So we are based out of Finland and we recently acquired and now we have a Northern European platform. So we've got uh, a data center in London, a data center in Iceland, and three data centers in Finland, all under the Vern Global brand. And um, that's uh, where we're going to build a more, shall we say, sustainable platform for the Nordics. Uh, and I'm, I'm passionate about uh, sustainability. Um, because uh, this is this is what we've uh, kind of started uh, to do, and and it's I've kind of grown into it, shall we say? Uh, Ten years ago, we started. Uh, we decided to go all in on uh, green energy, and and um, we realized that this was a trend in the in the industry, and uh, it's it's exciting and fun to uh, be able to sort of uh, provide services that that the customers are excited about and also investors because I, I see that often it's investors and the industry that's even more excited and then the customers they they really like it um so so they uh they give great positive feedback about it and it just feels upon itself that's terrific thank you avery Hi, uh, Avery Bell. I'm with Kohler Power. Uh, I'm an engineered solutions manager for Kohler. Uh, so I handle data center accounts across the, the country and across the globe. 
Um, I'm passionate about today's topic because while I've been in the industry for seven to eight years or so, um, I'm still a pretty young person in our industry. Um, and ultimately, there will be a lot of people that, that leave our industry or age out, and I'll still be in it. Uh, so I don't want to be the one holding an empty bag of promises that other people are making, but potentially aren't delivering. So I want to ensure that I'm part of the solutions to, to drive the change. Thank you, Avery. Last but not least, Patrick. Hey, thank you for having me. Uh, Patrick Gingrosso uh, with uh, MCFI, Mission Critical Facilities International, uh, responsible for their their, their uh, modular portfolio, whether, <clears throat> excuse me, whether it's our modular data center solution that we've developed or our, our small uh, microgrid solution using fuel cells and, and solar. Um, all of our solutions are really being developed around what's more socially responsible for our whether it's energy offsets or whether it's uh, using low carbon steel or, or recycled steel and low carbon cement and, and other materials to really drive down uh, the, the carbon footprint. I think my uh, journey through sustainability is a personal one. I started and really got into and really was made aware of what green was when green wasn't cool back in the early 2000s, uh, developing fuel cell projects for UTC power trying to sell the, 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 the story of green when nobody would, would buy it. Um, and then later it kind of developed into something more passionate when I was doing stuff with my daughter with white guides. And one of my favorite sayings with, with that was always leaving the, the place you visit like a campsite in a better condition than when you found it. And I think that applies to the, 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 the global community because we're only here visiting, right? So really want to leave it a better place than where we found it. Well said, well said. And uh, actually, I'm going to stick with you, Patrick, for just a moment and pose the first question on the panel, if you'd like. Uh, great, great. Well, as we begin here, obviously, you just hit on it, but we're definitely seeing a growing trend of data center companies actually creating ESG, sustainability departments, even climate neutral service departments. Why is that so important for the industry? And what should these departments be focusing in on for the next five years? Yeah, I mean, I think it's being driven right now as uh, people are trying to meet their ESG scores, frankly. But the longer term need for it is the data center industry is coming under fire because of its use of uh, its heavy use of energy and its heavy use of water um, and the impact that we do make uh, on the environment at, at a local level. And and frankly, the the, the what things people need to start thinking about is how do you reduce uh, your energy dependence on the grid, right? The grid has been a, a challenge for a lot of people lately. You've heard about it in Loudoun County. You've heard about the challenges in in, in Dublin and, and Frankfurt and elsewhere. Uh, so A is how do you minimize and reduce your dependence on the grid? Um, second is, uh, you know, I think implementing sustainable building practices as, par as, as also in line with what I talked about earlier, um, and, and reducing your, your carbon, your, your footprint, and not only just on an ongoing basis, but in the early stages, and as part of that value cycle. So creating and really embracing the, 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 the reduced carbon, the, the value chain, a sustainable value chain, I think is important, and people need to understand that better, and how do you do that? Um, and then I think finally, in order to show what you're doing, we really need to have and, and implement and embrace a... Uh, more verifiable carbon tracking solution, right? And system that once you start tracking it and me being measured on it, you start to reduce and you can you can do a better job of understanding where, where your challenges are and how do you meet those challenges. That makes sense. Well, let me follow up with that question. Um, and Wes, let me pose this to you. So obviously data center demands are at an all time high. I'd like to get a better idea about your company and other companies you're aware of and what their strategies are for the conservation. What resources do these data centers need to be focusing in on here into the future? Yeah, I mean, so we have a slight advantage in that, you know, we're a, a startup in the last, you know, couple of years. So we're starting from really a fresh, clean slate. So it's not true of everything, but if you look back, back to Patrick's comments, if you look back at ESG and the, 
I mean, look at the industry. The Internet's 32, 33 years old. You started out in closets, floors, you know, rooms, then buildings, now campuses. So our impact on the environmental conditions is much greater than it was years ago. And if compute grows at the rate that I think we all are being prepared for, you know, we have to get more conscious about it. On our side, you know, we've developed water-free cooling. So we've been doing this now from the beginning. So because we start out in the West where there are serious droughts and population growth, we have developed a water-free cooling system. So it's dry cooled, it uses no water, and it still achieves well in the evenings at 1.1 PUE on probably the hottest days of the year, maybe 1.3. So it's highly efficient and, and it can be done. You know, most homes today are on central air systems and they don't use water. So, you know, if you think about our system, I mean, it's very complex but and simple, but it really, it's, it's like a central air system on steroids. So, but water use for us has been a real focus and so is renewable energy. But I have to, you know, put quotes, air quotes around that. Renewable energy for us, we really prefer to do it locally with local programs because it's really the communities, the local communities. Of course, there's a global impact, but where we can make the biggest difference are the cities and communities that we develop in. So we highly influence renewable programs locally. We, we don't do PPAs, um, but we do local reps. And if we have to, national reps, if the local reps aren't available. But, you know, those are really prime pieces for us. And I would say building design, you know, our 150 plus exterior walls, you know, hot and cold spots. We use robots, aerial drones to use LIDAR to detect hot and cold spots. So for us, it's really holistic from building design to the actual operations of the data center. But, but I really think it can be done, but it is largely impacted more on new designs than it is to go back and fix legacy designs. Understood. Understood. Great. Well, let me uh, pose my next question to Kim. I would like to get a feel from you in terms of how you and your organization are reusing excess wasted heat uh, in the heating grid. And how are you getting there to achieve that zero carbon footprint? Yeah. Um, so here in the Nordics, uh, we do have uh, district heating grids. So, so this is about, um, shall we say, the ecosystem that uh, data centers uh, need to kind of plug into. I think uh, this is true in many other areas relating to energy, you know, such as if you're talking about uh, using hydrogen, for instance, you need the ecosystem out there. But specifically for the district heating, um, you, you can, of course, uh, reuse heat when you've got a data center outside the grid, uh, say far away from, uh, from cities. Uh, but then you, you typically have to build it out yourself. So, so you use the excess heat to heat buildings or whatever. Um, so uh, we uh, put our data center or we acquired a data center uh, where there was already a pipe uh, for district heating running right outside. So we only had to implement, you know, uh, 50 meters or 100 meters of, of uh, pipe. And uh, we also use um, uh, air cooling. So... So it's 100% uh, free air cooling. So there's no water involved in the actual cooling process. But then uh, we have heat exchangers that turn that excess heat uh, to, to water. And, and that water we uh, feed back to the district heating grid. Um, and you can, you can also do that uh, in, in two different directions. So you can put it kind of in the hot direction and in the cold direction. And, uh, and the point of putting it in the cold direction might be that uh, if um, you're not heating it up enough to put it in the uh, hot direction. Because the challenge for us is that we need to heat up the, um, 
the water to um, about 100 degrees uh, centigrade. So, so we need to prime it first, and it takes uh, some, uh, some electricity. Now, um, as for the climate neutral part, um, we already uh, did climate neutral certification without this in place, actually. Uh, and this we did uh, by, by minimizing our footprint, of course, using, using green energy is the most important part, but then uh, uh, just simply offsetting the remaining footprint. And during this, we actually got a climate neutral certification. Uh, but our kind of thought process is going beyond climate neutral and the district heating uh, actually allows us to, to do that because uh, currently the district heating company uh, utility is using some fossil fuel to, uh, to heat the water. Now, because we're buying 100% green energy and we're feeding the excess heat back into the grid, we're actually offsetting uh, some of the fuel, of, of the uh, fossil fuels that they are using. So that kind of gives us, in a way, a positive footprint. Um, there's no standard for that yet, but uh, you, you have to sort of calculate it yourself if, if you want to actually put the numbers down. Uh, but, but I think... Uh, this really highlights the role of, of data centers in the ecosystem and increasingly becoming a producer, uh, shall we say, of energy. Uh, once we get to a point where we also use hydrogen, um, if the pl power plant for the hydrogen is nearby, they could also have excess heat, which you could then combine with the data center uh, for an additional benefit. Yeah, that's fascinating. And you're right. A record setter as well, right? You need to set the tone for everyone else. Uh, Avery, any additional comments on this? No, I, I was just going to mention sort of what, what Kim was uh, referring to there with, you know, combined uh, heat and power systems. I think in a future state, as um, Patrick was talking about how we can try to reduce our dependency on the grid, Hopefully there's more opportunity for us to use gaseous engines potentially localized to the data center. Um, you know, in the near term, maybe that's natural gas. In the future, hopefully we're able to leverage a green hydrogen source, again, potentially localized. Um, but leveraging that heat in a way that can actually be used for cooling uh, is an important aspect also of, of the data center vision for the future. So some do that today, but um, I'm hopeful that there's further adoption in the future. Yeah, I definitely think, you know, I, I'd like to see more on-site generation being done. Uh, I think there's still a lot of unknowns or, or uh, education to be done with end users. <clears throat> uh, distributed generation, uh, through some studies I've seen, can actually help you offset some capital costs by doing on-site generation. You can actually offset and reduce some capital with regards to diesel generators. So you can reduce or eliminate diesel generators which is an additional benefit as well as batteries and, fuel and, and whatnot. So whether you do it with a gaseous engine or an engine that runs on hydrogen or a fuel cell, uh, there are definitely opportunities uh, for on-site generation that reduces that dependence on the grid. <coughs> Thank you, Ray. Absolutely. Interesting. So let me change gears a little bit. I mean, everything that you all are speaking of, innovative to say the least. And it leads me to a question about an area not everyone's familiar with, but the green, the green bond market. Uh, when I was uh, prepping for today, I, I read up and found out that it's valued over $700 billion right now. And it's just continuing to gain traction for issuers and investors. Kim, I'd love to call on you and maybe you can first start by defining what a green bond is and maybe elaborate on the shades of green out there. And then I'm going to ask you a follow-up question to that. Sure. Um, so um, a couple of years ago, when we were looking for financing, we went to the banks and uh, looking at different alternatives. And, and then uh, we realized that a bond sounds like a good idea in, in our industry because, because it's a bullet. So, so it works well when you're a growing company. Um, in conjunction with this, uh, we decided that uh, because we have a good green track record, we would try to go for a green bond. 
And um, the way it works is that you need a second opinion. So you've got these second opinion providers out there who then uh, uh, go through, you know, what you've done. And, and in our case, they really liked, um, you know, the, the fact that we'd been using green energy. Uh, we've also got our own power plant on top of one of the data centers. So they loved the fact that we were adding to the supply. And then uh, we also uh, like to do sale and leasebacks. So we acquired, for instance, Fujitsu's main data center in the Nordics and leased that back. So they really liked the fact that we were using existing buildings. So you don't have to construct new buildings, for instance, uh, and, and so on. So all of these criteria, uh, in addition to heat reuse, is what they look at. And based on these criteria, in addition to, for instance, your governance uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, stuff like, do you, do you think about the uh, sustainability aspect in all of the projects? Mm -hmm. um, they then sort of categorize you. So, so these guys, for instance, uh, Cicero is um, a Norwegian climate research institute. So they have a subsidiary that only does these uh, second opinions. So they grade uh, the bonds. Uh, you can be light green, medium green, or dark green. And thanks to all of these uh, 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 things that we were doing in this area, we, we got the dark, best dark green rating. And that was actually a first in the world. So, so pretty happy about that. Uh, there's, there's other uh, green bond rating providers out there who then have uh, different sets of criteria. But... Uh, yeah, I think the value of that is really, uh, for, for the customers, it doesn't matter so much. But of course, uh, we're in an industry that's really driven by capital. So those guys in, the, in that industry, they, they really love uh, getting a green bond. So it makes a lot of sense. And when you do it, you, you have to, of course, commit to some goals. So, so you, you've also got a process. So that's how it kind of drives you uh, to enhance further in that area. So it does play an important role uh, in the sa same way that, that all of the investors in the area that are looking for more and more green um, investments does. That's interesting. Congratulations on the dark green rating. Wes, Thanks. anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that what Kim is saying is, is really true about it's it's not it's not just so much to be green, but you you're doing it with like-minded investors, and that's oftentimes the most difficult part of this business is getting people that are in the same group that have a long-term view and they share your same passion over design, build, and then operations. So I think there's that as well. But I would say that, like in our case, we would do it regardless of the green bonds. If they weren't, if they weren't available out there, but but we love it, right? It's it's a to us, it's a competitive advantage. Generally, these are at a, a lower rate, um, but but we love the green bond market. Um, I mean, I don't see any downside to it. That makes sense to me. That makes sense to me. Well, let me turn over to Avery, and I'm going to change gears one more time and. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about reducing data center energy losses when it comes to PDUs, power distribution units. How are you monitoring those energy losses and how do switch rack PDUs play a part in the process? Sure, uh, I'd be happy to, to answer that one. I'll, I'll give you the caveat that again, I'm, I'm the, the power guy or the generator guy. So most of my experience in this space can, comes from a previous life when I was with Vertiv uh, doing some audits and, and such with customers. So the, the biggest use case that I see for a um, rack, rack PDU that's switched or, or metered on the outlet level is, is truly to identify the wasted watts. So the most, I've heard it, it said the, the most efficient watt you can use in the data center is the one that's never used. So um, a, a problem that sort of plagues data centers today is zombie servers. So 
the servers that sit in racks that never get used, but sit idle doing absolutely nothing. Um, so rack PDUs that have the, the granularity uh, that can correlate to the IP address of the, the compute uh, can help us drive to better understand what's being used and what's not. Um, and similarly, I, I think we could take it a step further uh, in a more theoretical approach um, mm -hmm. to say that within all of this compute, there is um, code, right? There's, there's kernels, there's uh, development. And within that code, there's efficient use of compute and then inefficient use. So uh, I think a good example of this is wearables. So I have, I have friends that work at, at Garmin. I'm not wearing a Garmin, but uh, they, they work at Garmin and they're responsible for the software that uh, drives these devices. And part of the goal is to optimize and ensure that um, they're not wasting or absorbing too much of the power that's reserved in this battery. It's finite. Um, and I think part of the paradigm that we have to sort of shift within our philosophy of data centers is that that power isn't uh, infinite. It is in some ways finite. So getting as far down to the granular level of understanding how software and computers can be more efficient. So partnering as CPUs to in advance uh, with the development of software to be more efficient with their watts. So I don't know if the metric of, of flops per kilowatt hour uh, is the future, but some mechanism that allows us to better trend. And right now, um, without a, a rack PDU that has the granularity to drive into the specific watts per each one of these devices, you're, you're not going to get that sort of detail. And I think it's, again, sort of a future state. I know DCIM allows us to identify those zombie servers and Hopefully you have the, the courage to unplug the things you're not using. But um, again, in the future, I, I hope we can find ways to be more efficient with, with compute. Interesting take on that. Great, well, let me go to the next question. Uh, I'd like to hear from, uh, well, I'll we'll start with Patrick, but I'd love to hear from all of you on this one. What are your top three, three, four recommendations uh, in order to keep hot data center aisles cool. Yeah, um, so <clears throat> so I don't know if it's it's keeping it cool, but at the end of the day, reducing the amount of energy you're using <clears throat> is is increasing the the temperature, the cold out temperature uh, of the data center, right? Um, Facebook just announced that they, I think it was Facebook announced that they're doing 90 degrees uh, inlet air. Uh, you know, matching up with what TC 9.9 ASHRAE, the ASHRAE group has been saying for a while of increasing that that temperature um, so that you kind of get towards an equilibrium and you're not using as much uh, uh, energy to to cool or remove the heat from the data center. So to me, that's number one. Number two, what I, I see a lot of uh, that needs probably a better best practice around is airflow management. Uh, you, we just don't see, I, I don't know if data center owners do enough around managing that airflow between the hot aisle and the cold aisle and doing the air dampening and the air damming and, and making sure that their IT people do the right things so that you don't have that <clears throat> hot aisle mixing back into the cold aisle or the hot air mixing back into the cold aisle. And then finally, if you really want to uh, drive efficiency and reduce the heat of the hot aisle, you can eliminate it altogether by using uh, things like uh, on-chip cooling, um, uh, immersion cooling uh, and rear door heat exchangers. Uh, they've been around a long time. IBM's used them for years. Water cooling in the data center. I know you know there's a lot of discussion around water and, and reducing or eliminating the use of water in the data center. But the, the reality is, water is the best medium for for and I'll say removing heat, not cooling, because ultimately what you're trying to do is remove the heat from the data center, right? You, you, and the reason you're cooling is because the heat's there generated by the IT. So if you can get closer to that IT load, remove the heat before it gets in the data center, then you don't have a hot out problem, right? You don't have a cold out problem. You just got to normally manage. And so what you can do is close water, cool it, close water loops. So you're not using water per se, finite amount of water in, gets recirculated constantly. So there's no, there's no real water usage other than the printer, uh, just filling it out. And then just using that solution to remove the heat from the data center um, is to me the, the the best way 
uh, to to lower or even remove that hot out challenge. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I no, agree just, with Pat. Go ahead, Wes. Sorry. I was just going to say <clears throat> containment pressure, air leaks, you know, blanking panels, just really block and tackling. And like Patrick said, higher, higher, higher set points, right? I mean, the old days, uh, somebody would walk in the data center and say it wasn't cold enough just uh, based on their temperature. So, you know, high, higher set points make a huge difference to the data center. And like Patrick said, it's not so much the cooling, it's removing the heat. So if you can seal it up, you know, uh, it makes a huge difference. Sorry, Avery, you were gonna say something. Well, I was going to say almost the same thing. I mean, containment is definitively number one. There's so many times where you go by a server and there's an empty like R2 RU that's just, all of that cool air is pushing itself back and just being completely wasted. It's completely inefficient. But I guess I, I would also say that within the, the cold aisle, uh, another strategy that I, I've seen implemented for furthering the efficiency there is um, proper load balancing. So a problem is also those hot spots, right, where there's workloads that are just generating so much heat in one spot that the cooling for standard uh, cooling uh, is is overloading and, and working itself into that space. So if you can further spread those workloads out to where you're you're creating that bathtub effect within that containment and instead of driving a hot spot, I think that's that's the simple, elegant solution. Uh, if, if you don't have the, the capital or the this infrastructure today to, to move to um, liquid cooling, immersion cooling, and things of that nature. Very good. Let me go to uh, the next question here. And if you had unlimited data center resources, unlimited budgets and funds at your disposal, I'd love to hear what the ideal airflow management plan would be. Patrick, you hinted on it uh, in the prior answer here, but now with that unlimited opportunity, I'd love to hear from all of you. Wes, maybe I'll begin with you, but what would that look like? Well, we've hit a lot of it, that water-free or at least lower water usage, even in areas where water is abundant, you know, generally that water is still coming from a treated culinary source. The refuse is going back to gray water and oftentimes the treatment of that water either needs to be retreated or it has to go back to irrigation. So, you know, water, no matter where it is, is still a resource. And as data centers, our job is to eliminate risk. And why, why create a 30-year data center that's dependent on a resource like that? So for us, it's big, big on water-free, um, higher set points, and you know, we, we push clients all the time to, to maybe start discriminating data. And what I mean by that is that for the most part, all of our clients treat all of their data the same, N plus one, two N designs. And it's, I just think that with the amount of compute we're talking about, if, if our chairs are connected, the seats in our cars, the wallets, everything is connected. You could go from 50 to 300 devices per person and the amount of compute is probably gonna explode. And I'm not sure that a five-year-old photo that got accessed once needs to be in a 5.9 data center. I mean, it costs me a lot of money to build per megawatt, but it's not just the money, it's the amount of equipment the carbon footprint going into the equipment to build generators, UPS, you name it. But I really think if we could advance our, our and bifurcate the data and start to really discriminate compute of what needs to be N or N battery or N plus one and really decide mission critical, hot, actionable, cold. I mean, I could go on about this forever, but I, I would really prefer not to build these monolithic data centers. I mean, I feel like there are different things that we can do, with, like natural gas cogen at site. We could eliminate, you know, with scrubbers, right, to clean the methane, but we could eliminate generators and UPS. 
but but the clients need to get on board with that and and i think that's a big change that whether we want it or not will probably come around because the amount of compute is going to grow exponentially Wes, I, I i agree with you uh, you know years ago we looked at even trying to talk to to, to people to, to data owners about when do you do the uh certain uh workloads right does it make sense to run batch a batch workload in the middle of the day when you can do it at night when the cost of electricity is 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 you know a lot cheaper so That's right it, nobody want nobody wants to it, it takes some time and effort to do that but i do think that there are strat strategies that you can to your point analyze your workload analyze what you're doing and go does it make sense to do it in the middle of the day or is it make is it better sense to do it at a later time when the cost of electricity is cheaper or there's less impact but also to your point we are starting to see um uh, we are starting to see and we're working with a company right now that's looking at i'll call it deep storage where you can store data off in the middle of nowhere that you only access every so often and i see that as a need over the next 10 20 years because we are collecting and being forced to collect more and more data through because of iot and because of everybody's camera and you know you got to store that data you can't throw it away because if something were to happen five years from now oh i need to get to that data and you don't have it right so you got to store it somewhere so i see that deep storage uh concept really coming into play to your point of getting it off of a five nines solution and putting it somewhere um, that's that's safe and can be accessed at a later date. I agree. Yeah, I I absolutely agree with uh, what's being said, but but uh, I'd like to you know move further on on the point that uh, Wes was making that it really comes from the customer because it's the customer that's requiring you know the n plus one, and very often it's it's non negotiable and. And you might not even, you know, have access to uh, the right people at the customer when you're responding to an RFP or whatever. So how are you going to kind of uh, uh, get your message to them that we're we're over engineering this? We're we're putting too much um, uh, kind of UPSs and uh, generators and what have you out there. So Kim, so, I think that can, I think that gets answered by charging them extra for this stuff at some point, right? So they're, they're paying for this extra stuff that they have, that they're using. But B, right. as you start tracking and monitoring people's carbon use, you know, not only doing it at, at, at a data center level for the data center owner, but for the clients that are using it so they can see their impact to your carbon footprint and how much they're contributing to it and let them start seeing that impact. Yeah. That's the only way you're going yeah. to change, right? Otherwise, it's just... Yeah, and, and preferably you'd kind of put a cost to to the carbon. Cost of it. Exactly. So you should carbon kind of either a direct or or kind of at least show them. Let them let them put the cost there themselves, or or do the calculation and show them that if you do this, this is how much more carbon we we're using. So so that all comes back to the to the data as well to to have data about everything, how much carbon we're using, and so on. Sense. Any other comments on that? Well, Laurel, your question was around flow and all that, <laughs> but it all it it is a, it's really circular. That and and I think these everybody's hit it. I mean, it is cost. It's desire to maybe be more green, and I think it'll just become a reality. Hot, cold aisle, whatever airflow. The fact is, compute is going to grow probably 10,000 X over five to seven years. I, I think we're still very much in an infant stage. And, you know, I just don't think we can keep building these just like we have them. It, it will require greener strategies and that will require different compute strategies. I think you're right. I think you're right. Well, that was actually uh, my last question to wrap up. Any final comments from any of you as we uh, head out to head out to our networking session? I just I, I think this is the right topic that is just getting more and more attention. 
Um, and let's hope it just continues and uh, moves off of talking into action. And at some point, people will have to realize that there's a cost to pay for uh, the data we use uh, and, and how we're going to mitigate it. And it just doesn't come for free. And it, it you know, like, like a lot of things, you just start, you have to pay more for it to, to make it happen. I agree. I think it's the right topic at the right time. And I think it's folks like you that are the trailblazers willing to talk about it and put the ideas forth. They're going to make it happen. So I do want to thank you for your time and your, your insights on these uh, various topics today. So again, a big thank you to Wes, to Avery, to Kim and to Patrick for joining us today. And what I'd like to do is uh, invite you to uh, hold on because we're going to move over into our live networking session and uh, go on over to, to that section. But before we do, I just wanted to give you a quick reminder that uh, we do have a next virtual roundtable. It's coming up on December 8th. And uh, maybe a sister topic to this, it's gonna be about infrastructure and sustainability predictions for 2023. And we invite you all to join us on that conversation as well. So anyway, this is a wrap. I'd love to uh, ask you to look for a playback on today's roundtable. It'll be coming soon to JSA TV and to JSA Podcasts on YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, and more. In the meantime, hold tight, and we will see you on the other side for a virtual roundtable. Thank you again to our amazing speakers today. Happy networking. Stay safe and have a great rest of your day.